was the summer of 1930. The new technology of communicating by radio over large distances was just a few years old, but business was booming. A young radio engineer working at Bell Telephone Laboratories in Holmdel, New Jersey, was given the assignment of finding out what natural radio signals might confuse transatlantic telephone communications. He had an antenna that would scan the horizon, looking for sources of interfering signals. His name was Carl Jansky. Here he is with his antenna. He changed astronomy forever. It's a wild looking antenna made of brass piping mounted on wheels from a Model T Ford. It rotated around once every 20 minutes, scanning the horizon. The antenna and receiver worked at a low frequency by today's standards, around 20 megahertz, but it was state of the art in those days. Jansky's apparatus recorded signals with a pen and moving chart, and he could also listen in with headphones. Jansky had everything up and running by 1931, and he saw and heard a lot of radio signals from thunderstorms, both near and distant. Now, if you've ever tried to listen to a radio during a thunderstorm, you appreciate that lightning makes lots of sharp bursts of radio static. It's tough to communicate through that. But Jansky saw something else, a faint but persistent radio hiss that swept across the sky each day. His antenna couldn't fix the precise location of the extra signal, but before long he realized that every day it was appearing a bit earlier. After a month, it had shifted two hours earlier. Now Jansky thought that this extra signal might be some odd emanation from the sun, but by chance there was a partial solar eclipse in August 1932, and the signals did not go away. After he had an entire year's worth of data in hand, he finally understood that the signals were coming from a fixed point in space, outside of the solar system. He had discovered radio waves originating from the center of the Milky Way. Jansky presented his work at a couple of meetings in 1933, and the news made the front page of the New York Times. The headline read, New Radio Waves Traced to Center of the Milky Way and the subheads noted its unchanging direction, its low intensity, and that there was no evidence of interstellar signaling. In 1933, people were interested in the possibility of intelligent life around other stars, and they still are. You might think that a discovery as monumental as this would cause astronomers around the world to drop their photographic plates and rush to build radio receivers. But that did not happen. Jansky gave some lectures and presentations at conferences, there was the article in the New York Times, and reports published in professional journals, but almost nobody rushed to follow it up. In part, this was because Jansky's discovery came out of a project in engineering. Dr. Woody Sullivan, a historian of radio astronomy, explained it this way, the basic discovery was a misfit neither fish nor fowl, it was unable to be appreciated by either the scientists or the engineers, and therefore lay untouched as an isolated curiosity. Of course, radio engineers knew about the discovery, but they viewed it from their perspective as something to take into account when building receivers. When work on radar began in Great Britain in the 1930s, engineers knew that besides the return signal reflected off an incoming aircraft, they could also expect to get some signal in their antennas from this celestial static. They called it Jansky noise. Carl Jansky had lots of other work to do at Bell Labs, and he never did much follow-up work on his celestial static. A few other scientists made attempts to detect the radio emissions, but it was clear that progress would require large antennas, and there wasn't the enthusiasm or the funding to build them. Carl Jansky died in 1950 at the age of 44. We can speculate that had he continued his work, or had he lived long enough to witness the explosion of radio astronomy activities that happened in the late 1950s, he would have certainly been awarded the Nobel Prize. Surely his discovery was one of the greatest in astronomy over the last 100 years, but he died young. To honor his achievement, the unit of radio wave intensity from astronomical objects is called the Jansky. Before we continue with the story, let's get oriented with the low energy part of the electromagnetic spectrum and agree on some terminology. <laughs> 
Frequency goes up to the right, wavelength increases to the left. The basic relationship is shown by the equation. The speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. We usually let the symbol C stand for the speed of light, which is a constant of nature. We use the Greek letter nu for frequency and the Greek letter lambda for wavelength. We can consider radio signals as waves, and the wavelength is the distance between two peaks of the wave. Jansky made his discovery at a wavelength of 14.6 meters, or about 50 feet, so his waves are really quite long. Here's where they are on the spectrum. Now, a wavelength of 14.6 meters is a frequency of about 20 megahertz. Our unit of frequency is the hertz, named after the German scientist Heinrich Hertz. A radio signal that has a frequency of one hertz means one wave passes by each second. In speaking of frequencies, we use prefixes like the kilohertz, 1,000 times per second, megahertz, 1 million times per second, and gigahertz, or 1 billion times a second. A gigahertz is 1,000 megahertz. So Jansky's antenna picked waves that were passing by at 20 million times a second. Early radio work began in the kilohertz regime, way over there. The technology was easiest at the lowest frequencies. Those waves are really, really long. So as radio engineers began pushing their way to higher frequencies, they began talking about shortwave radio. It's all relative, of course, and by today's standards, we certainly don't think of a wavelength of 14.6 meters as being short, but Jansky did. Today, radio astronomers work at frequencies ranging from megahertz to terahertz, and a terahertz is a million megahertz. Wavelengths can be smaller than a millimeter. Still, we're often stuck with old names, and the phrase shortwave radio is still used. Back to our story. It's the mid-1930s, in the midst of the Great Depression. Radio waves had been discovered from interstellar space, but no one seemed interested. The person who enters the story of radio astronomy next has to be one of the most singular scientists of the 20th century, Grote Reber. Imagine this. You're a few years out of college with a degree in electrical engineering, and you're working in the electronics industry. You're living at home in a Chicago suburb. You're an avid amateur radio operator. You've read of Jansky's discoveries. In Reber's own words, quote, it was obvious that Jansky had made a fundamental and very important discovery. Furthermore, he had exploited it to the limit of his equipment facilities. If greater progress were to be made, it would be necessary to construct new and different equipment, especially designed to measure the cosmic static. That's what Reber said. So what would you do? What Grote Reber did was to design a dish 31 feet across build it in the vacant yard next door, outfit it with homemade receivers, and begin scanning the skies, looking for the signal that Jansky saw. As Reber put it, the dish was, quote, as large as possible, consistent with available funds. And what were the available funds? His own pocket money. Grote Reber designed and built the first dish ever to be used for radio astronomy. He built it using the cheapest possible materials with wooden beams and a galvanized iron surface. He personally cut, drilled, and painted all the wood and attached the metal reflecting surface by himself. He became the world's first radio astronomer. It was a remarkable achievement. If you look closely, you'll see a picket fence in the lower right of this photo. That marked the end of a neighbor's backyard. This dish was not built in a remote farm field. This dish filled a suburban lot, much to the curiosity and astonishment of the neighbors. If the dish design looks familiar, it's because it is. Reber got all of the basic design features of radio dishes just about right, with no one to guide him. Parents, if your daughter or son seems intelligent, curious, and interested in the world around them, if they have ideas, perhaps unconventional, perhaps somewhat outside the mainstream of science, if they want to do something that might strike you as peculiar. Parents, think of Grote Reber. Let your daughter fill your backyard with a radio telescope. Let your son have the garage. After a few weeks, you won't miss the yard or the garage at all, and who knows what they might find. Besides Reber's knowledge of how to collect and focus radio waves, he knew something else, 
something very important. If the radio radiation that Jansky detected came from a thermal source, then that source would emit more or less like a black body, following Planck's curve. This is extremely important, and let's look at what it means. Here's our old friend, the electromagnetic spectrum. And now we've made it two-dimensional, with the vertical axis being intensity of radiation and the horizontal being frequency. And look at the scale. Double the frequency, and the signal gets four times stronger. We've put Jansky's point on the figure and drawn a Planck curve through it for a very cold black body, an object at only 100 kelvins above absolute zero. You see the implications immediately. For Jansky to have detected anything at his low frequency of 20 megahertz, that thing should come screaming in at higher frequencies, if, if, if it is thermal emission. Now, Reber knew this, so he made his first measurements in 1938 at what was then the very high frequency of 3300 megahertz, a wavelength of only 9 centimeters long, about the width of my palm. What did he detect? Nothing. Not a single thing. If it was thermal emission that Jansky saw at 20 megahertz, then at 3300 megahertz it should have been more than 20,000 times stronger. But the signal was not there. What would you have done if you were Grote Reber and had just spent your last penny to build this contraption? Reber kept going. Nothing showed up at 3300 megahertz, so he tried a lower frequency, closer to the frequency where Jansky worked. He rebuilt his entire receiving system to work at 910 megahertz. And here's his second point on our chart, 910 megahertz. During late 1938, Reber scanned the skies at 910 megahertz. The result? Still nothing. Nothing. Strike two. What would you have done? Here's what Reber said, and I quote, It was disappointing. However, this had the effect of whetting my appetite for more. Perhaps the actual relation between intensity of the celestial radiation and frequency was opposite from Planck's law. He changed his frequency again, rebuilding all of his receiving equipment. This time he dropped it to 160 megahertz. At last he got a signal. His guess was correct. The radio emission discovered by Jansky did not follow a Planck curve, but was actually the reverse. Instead of getting stronger at high frequencies, it was stronger at low frequencies. Reber used his homemade dish to map the sky and discovered that this new emission was concentrated to the Milky Way's band of bright stars. Just as Jansky had discovered, the radio signals most intense were those towards the center of the Milky Way. But there were also a few hot spots whose origin was unknown. Here's Reber in a photo taken many years later, posing with some of his early equipment. And here's a map that he made of the radio emission from the sky. He not only confirmed Jansky, he made a real radio map of part of the sky. These are two maps of the same regions of the sky, oriented so that the Milky Way is horizontal. The upper map is at 160 megahertz, and the lower map at 480 megahertz. The maps show two important things. First, most of the emission is confined to the plane of the Milky Way. Second, the emission is more extensive and brighter in the upper map, at the lower frequencies, exactly the opposite of what you would expect from thermal black body emission. Not bad for a backyard scientist. Parents, are you still with me here? Reber discovered something that it took scientists a while to figure out. Nature can produce radio waves by a process that has nothing to do with heat. If you take an electron traveling near the speed of light, and our Milky Way galaxy is full of these things, and it encounters a magnetic field, and our Milky Way is threaded by magnetic fields, the electrons will spiral around the field, producing electromagnetic radiation whose intensity rises to lower frequencies. That's what Jansky and Reber saw. Here's the expected behavior of thermal, black body radiation compared with non-thermal radiation. Electrons and magnetic fields give off no light at all, and they are a pure discovery of radio astronomy. This discovery opened the way to an entire universe of phenomena that we are still exploring. It put radio astronomy on the map in the early 1940s. Grote Reber went on to many other activities, always by himself and always moving through scientific territory where there were few paths. In 
I was lucky to get to spend some time with Reber when he visited the Green Bank Observatory where I work. For a couple of years, he spent summers there. Unlike Jansky, who died so young, Reber lived into his 90s. He was one of the most unusual and most interesting people that I have ever met. He was infinitely curious. If he saw something he didn't understand, he'd stop and check it out. Plants, rocks, traffic patterns, it did not matter. The world for him was one big experiment. He moved his telescope to the Green Bank Observatory and reconstructed it with several new features where it can be seen today. In a later lecture, we'll take a look at it up close. While Reber was in the Green Bank Observatory, he also inaugurated our new auditorium with a special lecture called The Big Bang is Bunk. Of course, Grote was wrong. I'm pretty sure that the Big Bang is not bunk. But here again, he saw the tide of science moving in one way and just had to swim in another, constantly challenging conventional wisdom. What an amazing guy. Reber's work was published in the Astrophysical Journal and caught the attention of scientists. But by then, most everyone's focus had turned to World War II. Let's talk a little bit about the non-thermal radiation. First, what a lousy name. This is radio radiation defined by what it is not. It does not follow the spectrum of a Planck curve. But before we get into the nitty-gritty of what Jansky and Reber saw, let's be sure that we understand what we mean by a spectrum, because the word's going to come up over and over in this course. A spectrum is the word we use to describe the intensity of electromagnetic radiation as it changes with frequency or wavelength. The great scientist of the late 1600s, Isaac Newton, discovered that if you put sunlight through a prism, it could be separated into a spectrum of different colors. This is the intensity of light at different frequencies. When we look at a Planck curve, it shows the spectrum of thermal black body emission. It varies in a specific way with frequency. A spectrum can be continuous, meaning that the intensity changes smoothly over a broad range of frequency. Or it can be discrete, meaning that the emission occurs only over a small frequency range. A Planck curve has a continuous spectrum. The intensity from a black body changes smoothly over a continuum of frequencies or wavelengths. Measure it at one frequency, and you can predict it at all frequencies. The non-thermal radiation that Jansky discovered is also continuous, but it rises smoothly to low frequencies. That's why Jansky's radio sources don't give off light, which is way over here on the spectrum. You see that if you just have a measurement at only a single frequency, you can't really tell the nature of the emission. Any one measurement can be fit by either a thermal or non-thermal spectrum. But if you can measure at a few widely separated frequencies, you can easily tell the difference. The non-thermal radiation that Jansky discovered is now called synchrotron radiation, and it was not properly understood until more than 20 years after his discovery when a Soviet physicist, Yosef Shklovsky, proposed that the radio radiation from the Crab Nebula arose from this process. The Crab Nebula is the remnant of a star that exploded in 1054. The name synchrotron refers to the fact that the same radiation is observed in synchrotron particle accelerators on Earth, when beams of electrons moving near the speed of light are forced to bend by magnetic fields. Non-thermal synchrotron radiation is the dominant radio signal in the sky at frequencies below about 1,000 megahertz, that is, frequencies below 1 gigahertz. Here's a modern map of the entire sky made with a large radio telescope near one of the frequencies where Reber did his measurements. It's the sphere of the sky flattened out in two dimensions, so it has an oval shape. Pretty amazing, isn't it? The map is oriented so that the Milky Way is horizontal with the map center toward the center of the Milky Way. Just for reference, let's overlay a photograph of the night sky in the same orientation. Not much in common, is there? We can see that the synchrotron radiation is concentrated to the disk of the Milky Way, but there are these large loops as well that have no counterpart in visible light. Some of them are almost 90 degrees across. That would be like something rising from the horizon on Earth and stretching nearly overhead. What we're seeing in the loops is the remnants of stars that blew up, stars that became supernovae. As they explode, their outer layers rush out into space, compressing the interstellar gas and magnetic field in front of them. 
This increases the intensity of the synchrotron emission, and many tens of thousands of years later, we see the large compressed shell that marks the outer boundary of a place where a cluster of these big stars went off. The electrons that we detect by their synchrotron emission are part of the same population that we see as cosmic rays. Decades before Jansky's work, scientists had discovered that the Earth was being bombarded constantly by high-energy subatomic particles. At first called cosmic rays, they're not rays at all. They're bits of matter. The electrons in the cosmic rays produce synchrotron radiation as they get tangled up with the interstellar magnetic fields. It took some time before scientists realized that some of the same cosmic ray particles that they were detecting from balloons high in the atmosphere were the cause of Jansky's radio static when they hit magnetic fields far out in space. And we now understand that many of the cosmic rays are produced by supernova explosions, the same process that produces the giant radio loops. Let me return a moment to the puzzle of Jansky's discovery to make an important point. The spectrum of a black body, the Planck curve, is determined by one parameter only, and that's the temperature. Two black bodies, one the size of a pumpkin and the other the size of the moon, emit radiation with the identical spectrum. And by that, I mean that the shape of the intensity versus frequency curve is identical. Now, of course, the amount of radiation that the moon emits is vastly more than a pumpkin does. But taking into account the difference in size, it's identical. The amount of radiation emitted per square meter of surface by two black bodies at the same temperature is identical. So here's the problem with Jansky. And this problem was understood very quickly. His radio signals from space are so bright at megahertz frequencies that they imply temperatures of more than a billion degrees. That's hotter than any physical object can get without being destroyed totally. Our poor kitchen stove that we heated so recklessly in the last lecture would long ago have been vaporized. So that was the puzzle and the challenge of those early measurements. What in the world could be producing radiation so bright and from so much of the sky? Of course, there's no problem if the emission is non-thermal, which has nothing to do with temperature. World War II started just at the time when Reber's measurements were being made and the attention of the world's scientists and engineers turned to the war. There was an enormous leap in radio technology with the development of radar and advanced communication devices. Dishes sprung up everywhere. These days we make a clear distinction between engineers who build things and scientists who study the laws of nature. The pioneers of radio astronomy didn't fit into such sharp categories. Jansky studied physics at the University of Wisconsin but worked as a radio engineer. In Australia, Joe Pawsey was a radio engineer who ended up pioneering radio astronomy. Reber was an engineer, but if what he did wasn't scientific research, then I don't know what is. During World War II, there was a tremendous cross-fertilization between various disciplines as people developed new radio technologies. That generation of scientists contained some almost unbelievably colorful characters. But then, many of them began their careers under extreme stress, sometimes working while combat was going on around them. After 1945, some scientists and engineers who had been brought together for the war effort turned their attention to radio astronomy. This happened worldwide, but it flourished especially in Australia, where a radar team at the Radio Physics Laboratory was directed to work only on non-military matters. Many took up radio astronomy. One in particular, Ruby Payne Scott, made radio observations of the sky in 1944. These radio astronomical observations were not only the first made anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere, but Payne Scott was the first woman radio astronomer anywhere in the world. Ruby Payne Scott had graduated with an honors degree in physics from the University of Sydney and was known as a brilliant mathematical physicist. In fact, she was described as one of the most talented physicists in all of Australia. She joined what was called the Radio Physics Laboratory, an Australian government organization, in August 1941. There were only two women on the scientific staff. She developed techniques for finding weak radio signals and created more accurate radar systems for detecting aircraft. In the late 1940s, Payne Scott, together with her collaborator Joseph Pawsey, made groundbreaking experiments that placed Australia at the forefront of radio astronomy. 
This is one of the antennas she used. Now, during World War II, radar stations in England, looking for German aircraft, discovered that the sun was emitting radio waves. Payne Scott and two colleagues observed the sun using a dish built for radar outside Sydney in October 1945 and discovered that its emission corresponded to a black body temperature of 15 million kelvins. Since the visible surface of the sun is actually only 6,000 kelvins, this was quite a discrepancy, comparable to Reber's work showing that low-frequency radio emission from the Milky Way was not thermal. The same measurements detected radio bursts, these are spikes of intense radio emission from the sun on top of the steadier signal. We'll talk more about Payne Scott's work in another lecture, but by 1950, she had a problem. She had a problem because in 1944, she had done something so monumental that it affected her career profoundly. She had broken a major rule. She had, I'm pausing here for dramatic effect. She got married. Remember, she worked in the radio physics lab, a branch of the Australian government. She was a government employee. At that time, the Australian government policy read, a female officer who marries shall, and here I quote directly, be deemed to have resigned from the date of her marriage. Your choice, ladies, a job or a wedding ring. Now, her co-workers from the lab knew that she was married, and they had tried to shield her, but the law was clear. A married woman could not be hired as a permanent employee and therefore would be ineligible to participate in a retirement fund. And as a temporary employee, she would need to be reevaluated for employment every year. The story is an ugly one. Despite the efforts of her colleagues who understood and valued her contributions, after all, she was critical to the success of the radio physics group. When the bureaucrats of the Australian government discovered Payne Scott's marital status in 1950, she was demoted to a temporary position and lost all her pension benefits for the preceding five years. She resigned her position in 1951 to have her first child because there were no provisions for maternity leave. Although she attended a conference on radio astronomy in 1952, that effectively ended her career in science, a loss for us all. Today, the Australian government labs sponsor the Payne Scott Awards to support researchers who have taken extended leave to care for a newborn child. Jansky, Reber, Payne Scott, three early pioneers of radio astronomy with three different trajectories to their careers. Let's end with something we left hanging at the end of lecture two, Jupiter. Back then, we noticed that the radio image of Jupiter showed two very bright lobes, which implied physical temperatures greater than 10,000 kelvins. Extremely hot emission from some place off the planet's surface that gives no light. Well, you're guessing by now that it must be non-thermal emission, coming from charged particles like electrons and cosmic rays hitting magnetic fields. And that's exactly what it is. In fact, what we're seeing here in the radio image are two separate objects. The round thing in the middle is Jupiter itself, and we're detecting its thermal emission. But surrounding Jupiter is an extended source of non-thermal radio emission. We still don't understand major features of Jupiter's radio emission. That planet's got a whopping magnetic field, more than 10 times stronger than the magnetic field of Earth. Energetic ionized particles streaming out from the sun, the solar wind, hit Jupiter's magnetic field, and they produce these belts of radio emission. And that's not the full picture. Jupiter has a number of moons in orbit around it. Galileo saw them. Jupiter's moon, Io, is particularly amazing. It has volcanoes that blast matter out into space and onto Jupiter's magnetic field. These particles cause bursts of radio emission and a permanent luminous aurora around Jupiter's poles. It's quite a spectacle. As Carl Jansky learned, as Grote Reber learned, and as Ruby Payne Scott learned, radio emission from the universe is giving us a glimpse into things we could not otherwise imagine.